Today's case takes us to a series of gruesome murders that were committed over a period of just one year. We're not talking two or three murders. We're talking about seven innocent lives taken away ruthlessly by a monster. But who was he? Why did he kill so many women? Is it really seven? Or is there more to this case than he's willing to reveal? Tonight, neighbors in Gary, Indiana, are shocked to find out the bodies of several women were found in their town. Police say all of them were killed by alleged serial killer Darren Van. Let's go to the focal point of these crimes, Gary, Indiana. Gary is a city in Indiana that was known for its industrial activity in the past. Being a steel hub back in the day, the city saw rapid growth with a diverse population, but this quickly changed in the 1960s because of the growing overseas competition in the steel industry. Today, Gary's population stands at about 69,000, and the place isn't known for much except for the endless rows of abandoned houses and murders. It earned a not so bragworthy name, the murder capital of America in the early 90s. Why is this information relevant to today's case? We are about to find out because this place is where everything was about to go horribly wrong. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we're going to be deep diving into the case of Darren Dion Van. Where'd you kill her at? Oh, see if I tell you that dog go to the house. Darren Dion Van was born on the 21st of March, 1971 in Indiana. There's not much known about his childhood. However, information about his early adult life paints the grim picture of an impending disaster. He joined the United States Marine Corps in 1991, but was discharged shortly afterward. In 1993, he received an other than honorable discharge, the details of which are not known. It's safe to say that it makes it clear that he wasn't a person of particular particularly sharp and clean character. Later, Van worked at a temp agency and he got fired from there too. He seemed to have trouble finding and keeping jobs. There was probably something about his personality or way of working that didn't go down well with his employers. He wasn't the hero of his personal life either. In fact, quite the contrary. He was married to a woman named Maria for 16 years. She was 29 years older than him. The marriage ended in 2009 because they grew apart long before Darren ventured out on his brutal killing spree in 2013 that continued through 2014. But I told her the guy's a nutcase. He is, and I, I'd watch him. It's possible that, unbeknownst to his then wife Maria, he murdered even more women between 2004 and 2009. Two horrifying incidences give us clues to Darren's malicious and dark intentions toward women. There are many reasons to believe that his affinity for violence against women began early and that there could be more than seven victims in this case. He had previously been arrested twice. Darren was reportedly arrested in Gary in 2004 for threatening the life of his then girlfriend, Saritha Grant. It was a class D felony and he spent only 90 days in jail. Yeah, only 90 days in jail for threatening the life of his girlfriend with cops witnessing the entire scene. In fact, the cops had to talk him out of it very carefully as he was choking his girlfriend right in front of them with a lighter in his right hand. He had even poured gasoline over Saritha and himself in front of the police. His girlfriend said, he doused me with gasoline, flicked his lighter, and threatened to burn me alive. Oh, and he was in a relationship with his girlfriend while he was already married to Maria. And that's not all. His violent and disrespectful behavior toward women didn't stop there. In December 2007, he was arrested again. He was charged with aggravated sexual assault. A 25-year-old woman who was a sex worker was responding to a call from her employer. She then met Van and the two went to an apartment. Van had become suspicious of her, probably because he saw her talking on her phone before they met. When they got inside, Van asked her if she was a police officer. When she said that she wasn't, he attacked her. Van yelled and told her that he could kill her. He demanded that she perform oral sex on him. When she declined, he hit her face several times. Van choked 
and took sexual advantage over the woman. Luckily, she managed to escape him afterward. When she was treated for her injuries, the marks around her neck were consistent with attempted strangulation. Van pleaded guilty to the sexual crimes and was convicted in September 2009. He was sentenced to five years in prison and was released on July 5th, 2013. Unfortunately, after his release, the Texan authorities labeled Van as a low-risk sexual offender. Despite his proven attempt to strangle a woman. Low risk means that they didn't think he was a predator and that this was probably a one-off event that wouldn't be repeated. I really don't know a lot about Darren because like I said, he was a creepy dude. I felt strangeness from him. In reality, their assessment and assumptions were very far from reality because he wouldn't just repeat the act of sexual violation, but would go on to end the lives of innocent women. Charges are now pending against him and the deaths of six other women and police say that number could go up. To date, there's not enough evidence to prove how many women Van actually killed. From his confessions and from the bodies that have been found in the areas he mentioned during his interrogation, it is estimated that Darren Dion Van killed between 7 and 18 women. Based on the evidence that was collected, he was charged for 7 murders in Indiana. For the others, there's not enough evidence to prove that Van committed those crimes. What happened in Gary, Indiana? After his release from prison on July 5th, 2013, for the sexual crimes, Van's monstrosity was about to take an even more brutal turn. Things were about to get really dark for Indiana. Africa Hardy was a 19-year-old young woman and was a beautiful girl who had moved to Chicago in the summer to live with her family. She planned on going to school and was excited about starting a new life. She had no idea that her dreams would never be fulfilled. Her mother, Lori Townsend, says that she was a 19-year-old, beautiful, intelligent young lady. She walked in a room and lit it up with her laugh, her smile, her beauty. She could make you cry, she could make you laugh, she made you think about things. She could walk in a room full of people and they just stop and because she was her smile her beauty she stunning beautiful my beauty queen hardy's cousins told the chicago tribune that africa enjoyed singing loved kids and wished to own a daycare someday she had plans on going back to school and we talked about it numerous times but I guess she started hanging out with different people and it took her toward another way. Hardy had an escort business and Van approached her by responding to an ad post on the website Backpage. He went by the online name Big Boy Appetite. Hardy texted her business partner at 5.17 p.m. on Friday, October 17, 2014, indicating that Van was with her at the motel. A lot of time passed, which was way beyond the normal time for an appointment. So Hardy's friend and business partner called her cell phone. She tried to get in touch with her eight times, but there was no answer. Eventually, she texted Hardy's phone and received a response that didn't sound like Hardy had written it. She immediately suspected that it was the man who wrote the message. She quickly called a male friend of hers and then the two proceeded to the motel room and what they found next horrified them. Hardy was dead. She was naked in the bathtub of the motel room with the shower running. There were red marks on her neck and it looked like she had been strangled with something thin. They immediately called the police. On investigating the crime scene, the police found a broken fingernail, a shirt button, a torn condom wrapper on the floor of the motel room. The beds had been moved away from the headboard, indicating that there had been a struggle. Video surveillance from the motel showed Van getting out from a dark SUV and entering Hardy's room around the time of the murder. Darren Dion Van immediately became the prime suspect in the case. Cell phone records of the man who answered Hardy's ad with the name Big Boy Appetite led the police to an address in the 600th block of West 49th Avenue in Gary, where a search warrant was conducted on Saturday, October 18th, 2014. Now, you might think that after being tracked down by the police, Van probably denied the killings and tried to act innocent. As shocking as it may sound, he did quite the opposite. Not only confessed to killing Africa Hardy, but also confessed that he had murdered at least five other women. Abandoned homes here used as a dumping ground for at least six women murdered in cold blood. Police want to know if there are more. 
When Van was caught, he was shocked that the police had tracked him down so quickly. He casually told them that he messed up, as if he was talking to his school teacher about skipping his homework. He made a murder look like it's nothing. The man was shameless and remorseless, as we will find out when we look at his interrogation later on. Van admitted to the police that he had responded to an ad posted under the name Octavia, drove to the motel, and murdered Hardy as the two had sex. He gave a bizarre reason for killing her when the police interrogated him about the murder. According to Van, the sex got rough and she started fighting with him. So he strangled her with his hands and then with a cord. Finally, he put her body in a bathtub. His cruel killing rampage began in January 2014. Seven women were ruthlessly murdered before his violent acts came to a halt. Darren sexually violated the women before strangling them and disposing of their bodies in an abandoned house around Gary, Indiana. He told the authorities where the other six bodies were, but by the time the bodies of the victims were found, most were already decomposed to quite an extent, making it difficult for forensic teams to determine the weapon or object used for strangulation. Hardy's mother told a local television station that she was expecting her daughter to come home in Denver, Colorado for Thanksgiving. I can't tell her I love her anymore. I can't give her hugs. I can't give her kisses. Unfortunately, Miss Townsend lost her daughter at the hands of a soulless murderer who had no empathy for anybody. We can only imagine how horrific Africa's last moments must have been. The chain of gruesome murder started in January 2014. Van's first victims were Tiara Beatty and Tanya Gatlin. On January 13th, 2014, 28-year-old Tiara Beatty was going out to meet a friend. She never returned. When her family members didn't hear from her for three days, they reported her missing. Her body was later located in one of the abandoned houses in Gary after Van's confession. At the time of her disappearance and murder, Tiara's son was only two years old. Her mom said that Tiara was mentally ill and trusted people too easily. When Tiara's boyfriend, Marvin Clinton, heard rumors that Tiara was dead in an abandoned building on the west side of Gary, he urged the police to search the area. They told him they couldn't because they didn't have the manpower. So basically, he was told that he's not going to get any help for a missing person who is potentially already dead because they don't have the manpower. This only makes one think, what is the police department for? It seems like the police didn't really want to do any work at all. Clinton said he ended up searching approximately 30 buildings on his own before officers told him it was unsafe to do so. Later, during Van's trial in 2016, when asked in court about why he killed Tiara, these were his words. Really? I just killed her. I'm gonna be honest. I ain't killed her because I killed her because I was mad. And she was the first person I ran into. A heartless and soulless psychotic killer indeed. Just like Tiara, Tanya Gatlin, 27, went missing in January 2014. Tanya also had a two-year-old son at the time of her disappearance. She struggled with addiction on and off for about 10 years, but was a vivacious and sweet woman, according to her mother. It was when Tanya Gatlin didn't show up for her son's second birthday that her mother began to fear that something had happened to her. Her body, too, was later recovered in one of the abandoned houses in Gary after Van pleaded guilty. The cold-blooded murderer attacked and killed his next two victims, Sonia Billingsley and Christine Williams in February 2014. 53-year-old Sonia Billingsley was a resident of Gary, Indiana. She went missing on February 7th, 2014. Sonia left the house after making a call. She was wearing curlers and her family didn't think she intended to be gone for long. But when she didn't return, the family knew something was horribly wrong. Soon after, they filed a missing persons report. On October 19th, 2014, her body too was found inside an abandoned house located in Gary, along with Tanya Gatlin's body. 36-year-old Christine Williams, a mother of four, was murdered by Darren over $40 worth of crack. Yeah, you heard that right. I'm sure you now have an idea of what kind of an evil person Darren really was. He literally killed a woman because she owed him $40, and he thought she had fled the town to avoid making the payment. In reality, Christine was not avoiding Darren, but was in jail for a few days. When she was released, Van tracked her down, strangled her, and dumped her body in the basement of an abandoned house. Her body was found inside a house on Massachusetts Street in Gary, Indiana on October 
October 19, 2014. In June 2014, another woman, Tracy Martin, went missing. 41-year-old Tracy Martin, a resident of Gary, Indiana, was reported missing on June 26, 2014. Darren had strangled her with her own necklace that was still around her neck when her body was found in yet another abandoned house on October 19, 2014, again on Massachusetts Street. In October 2014, 35-year-old Anith Jones went missing. Anith Jones was from Merrillville, Indiana. Her abandoned car was discovered in the driveway of an abandoned house in Gary, Indiana, and her body too was found inside the house. According to court records, Van told detectives that a mutual friend had offered him $500 in cash and drugs to make Jones disappear because of an upcoming legal matter. Van spoke to Jones several times by phone before meeting her in an empty Merrillville house sometime in October. Van said that he had sex with Jones and then strangled her to death, according to an affidavit. A friend of Jones also told the police that Jones used to find people via online escort services like Hardy. Anith Jones's brother had posted his grief in a heartbreaking post on Facebook after having to identify his sister's body. The images I seen when I had to identify my sister's body, the last words we had together, the many pictures I see with her smiling, and imagine what she went through during last moments. The thoughts of whether she called me for help during her final moments, and why this way? Help me, Lord. Help. And the final victim of Darren's brutality was Africa Hardy. It was the discovery of her body at Motel 6 that led the police to find Darren Dion Van and arrest him. You're probably wondering that so many women went missing in the course of 10 months. Why didn't anybody notice or investigate the disappearances? Turns out that someone tried to find the unknown serial killer even before any of the murders of 2014 happened. Thomas Hargrove was a reporter with the Scripps Howard News Service, and later he founded the Murder Accountability Project. In August 2010, he used an algorithm to analyze crime data, which strongly suggested that a serial killer was prowling around Gary, Indiana. According to his findings, the killer may have murdered at least 18 women. He repeatedly urged the local authorities to look into the 15 suspicious deaths between 1980 and 2008 that he had identified via his algorithm. However, his constant requests fell on deaf ears. The local authorities denied his claims, as according to them, there was no evidence or signs of a serial killer around. It was a serious lack of action and negligence from the authorities that led to so many missing persons cases and the murder cases going cold. This probably played a part in Van getting away with many murders so easily. He probably thought that he would never be caught, but thankfully, his wish to roam as a free murderer for all his life wasn't fulfilled. The first question that comes to anyone's mind is, how did he find his victims frequently in such short intervals of time? Van used a website called Backpage, which is a classified ad site that is used by sex workers to find their clients. He contacted Hardy after he saw an ad there. Van's username was Big Boy Appetite. Well, that name is as cringy as he is. He used the website to find his victims by answering their personal ads. When Van was taken into custody, he spoke confidently as he had just achieved something great. Not only did he agree and confess to killing seven women, he also told the police that he killed even more people in Indiana going back 20 years. About the motive, the authorities said that there's no specific reason he did this, which makes me think that he was mentally deranged and could probably be termed as a psychopath? Let me know what you think in the comments. During the interrogation, he also told the police the locations of all the bodies. Indiana court records show that Van was arrested in April 2004 for residential entry and intimidation in Gary. This was the incident with his then girlfriend, Saritha Graham, which we talked about at the start of the video. As part of an agreement with the prosecutors, he pleaded guilty in June 2004 to misdemeanor and residential entry while the felony charge of intimidation was dropped. It seems like the authorities were quite lenient and let him go too many times. He literally threatened to burn the house down and burn his then girlfriend right in front of the police. This clearly shows that he was a violent and unafraid monster who was capable of acting on his malicious instinct. The felony charges were dropped and what would have been a year in jail 
turned into just a 90-day jail time, and that was after he violated the probation rules. Looking at the current case where he confessed to murdering seven women, the people close to him were quite shocked when they learned about the murders. His ex-wife Maria said that he was nothing like that, and in 16 years of marriage, she had never dealt with any kind of violence from him. Here's what she said in an interview. This is all unbelievable to me, she said. A total shocker. I never knew him to be violent, never. According to her, Van was friendly, protective, and not abusive at all. She had met Van through a friend and they got married in 1995. Even though they got divorced in 2009, they had been estranged since 2005. She said he never once mistreated her. Well, it's safe to say that despite being married to Van for 16 years, she didn't know a thing about who he really was. Maybe he manipulated her too into believing that he's a nice human being, but 16 years is a long enough time to call BS on someone's guys. I wonder how she didn't have a clue. She went on to say in this interview, he was also protective of those around him. He was a real friendly person. That's why all this is a shock to me. He had a job all the time. If he lost one, he would quickly get another one. Just like his victims, maybe, he always quickly found one after another to vent out his rage. He mercilessly took away innocent women's lives because maybe he treated them as jobs too? He didn't drink. He was a loner more than anything, his ex-wife said, as if being a teetotaler or aloof is a sign of a sainthood. According to records, Van failed to show up for court proceedings, and so the divorce was finalized in 2010. Van's brother, Reginald Beard, 30, apologized to the families of the victims. He expressed his shock too. In fact, he was so shaken that he said he needed to find a new place to stay for himself and his daughters. He was scared and in total disbelief when he heard that his brother's crimes could go back decades. If there was one person who was really suspicious of Darren Dion Van's character and behavior way before the murders, it was his ex-wife, Maria's son. Edward Matlock. He said that Van had many odd habits. Many times he used to talk to himself. You say hello, he's like, hello, and he looks down to the ground. Or if you turn around, he's like talking to himself slowly. He was strange. He was weird. As Matlock told CNN, and I told it, the guy has a nut case. He is. And I, I had to watch him. And I never allow him near my kids or in my home because uh, he just creeped me out. Period. Matlock said things went downhill for Van after he got fired from a temp agency, adding he had trouble finding good work after that. Eventually, Van and Maria, Matlock's mother, moved from Austin to Gary, Indiana, where Matlock said he found them living in poverty. The other residents near the houses where the bodies were found told the police that these houses have been vacant for nearly a decade. There are large trees and bushes around them, so even if someone were to go inside, the neighbors wouldn't be able to see or notice. It's easy to see why Van hid the bodies in abandoned houses. He knew that it was difficult to find the bodies, and the homeless wouldn't complain about the stench. One of the residents said that for years, he has tried to get the city to clean up the abandoned homes or tear them down, but nobody has paid any attention to his pleas. Gary residents aren't wrong at all. This case proved it. With so many abandoned houses and overgrown trees and wild bushes, it's easier for criminals like Darren Dion Van to commit crimes, hide evidence, and even victims' bodies, as one can't see anyone coming or going to the vacant houses. Also, in a place like this, all of the evidence can go unnoticed for months or even years. After the tragic murders, finally, some measures were taken. At least those buildings where the victims' bodies were discovered were completely torn down and turned into memorials. According to Gary Mayer, Karen Freeman Wilson, Van seemed to prey on those who would be less likely to be reported missing. So he made sure that he minimalized all chances of him ever being caught. He chose sex workers as his victims, who can be considered a weaker group due to a lack of societal acceptance or support. He disposed of their bodies in abandoned houses in Gary where nobody would even notice. Eventually, and thankfully, his evil crimes came to an end. Evidence was found and he did get caught. Talking about evidence, the Hammond detectives in Indiana didn't do a great job of finding the bodies in the daring murder cases. They not only overlooked evidence, but also failed to find a mummified body in the closet of the abandoned houses that they had searched. After only two days, the body was found when the house was searched again. But like, 
how embarrassing. For the past two weeks, the local and national media has focused much negative attention on the Hammond Police Department. Despite the excellent job they have always done making Hammond a safe suburb of Chicago's south side, many have jumped on this bandwagon locally as well. Eventually, the authorities were able to find all the bodies in the houses that Van had told them to look into. Although the bodies weren't fully skeletal yet, they were badly decomposed as some of them had been there for quite a long time. It is important to note that Darren Dion Van killed all of his victims by strangulation. According to forensics and crime investigations, strangulation is known to be a very personal and intimate method of murder. This means that it's not easy to murder someone in this manner as it takes some time for the victim to die and you're face to face with them, probably looking them in the eyes. It takes a special type of cruel to do something like this, even once. Our criminal in question, Darren Dion Van, killed his victims by means of strangulation, not once, but at least a whopping seven times minimum. He murdered seven beautiful and innocent women by strangling the life out of them. After his arrest, Van was interrogated, and what he said about the murders and the way he said it will shock you. Although all the footage was not released or made available for public consumption, there's still enough to give away a lot about the kind of person Van really was. The actual recordings total roughly 14 hours of interviews over the course of four days from October 18th to October 21st, 2014. From his words to his body language and behavior, it's not difficult to understand how cold and emotionless he really is. The way he's talking to the interrogating officers, it looks like he's chilling. It looks like he's out catching up with his friends to go watch a game of football or something. His voice doesn't even crack once, and he doesn't seem to feel ashamed at all. The interrogating officers seem to do a pretty good job at making the Gary Strangler feel all important and intelligent. You also seem to be pretty intelligent, so I think you know what T, you're talking about. Okay, T is young, the girl is missing, I think they say she was late 30s. Or this helps them to get more information from Van because he feels more comfortable with them, like he's talking to some friend and not the legal authorities. And it worked. Van did reveal a lot of information. Right at the beginning of the interrogation, Van is talking about a prostitute named Casper. Her nickname on the streets was Casper. She was a prostitute. Who he claims was his friend. He says he killed her, and he starts giving directions to her body's whereabouts to the investigators. If you notice how casually he speaks, it's like he's helping a stranger on the road find an address. It's appalling to see how unbelievably and obnoxiously cool Van is about the entire situation. When the interrogators ask him to take them with him to find the bodies, to show them his work, he says, I don't really call it work. I call it my my mistakes. Your rages? Yeah, my rages. When stuff don't go right, I go looking for an out. You see how he's calling these murders his mistakes? His rages when stuff don't go right? He says he goes looking for out. So basically, the remorseless, psychotic killer is expressing how murder is his way of letting off steam. He's making it look like a hobby or something, like reading or listening to music. Normal people would indulge in hobbies like these, of course, or just do nothing when they're frustrated or upset, but this guy totally blows my mind. His reasons are the worst. When the authorities ask him what's the connection of his rage with the murders, he says, They're, they're random. They're random. All it does is tell the wrong person to say something or it triggers something from my past. Wow, okay. so. If you want to save yourself from a psychopath like Van, you simply need to be out of his sight. He randomly kills people whenever he pleases. And if you trigger any of his past traumas, you're sure as hell to end up in his list of murders. I don't know what's more bizarre at this point, Darren Dion Van himself or his reasons to literally kill a living, breathing person because of random reasons. Illinois probably has a whole lot of they have more than Indiana, so they did. Yeah. They have way more than Indiana. If what he's saying is to be believed, then there are way more innocent victims who fell prey to this devil's mind. If you notice, when he's talking about more victims, he's almost excited. 
It's like he's reenacting his achievements to the two investigators. He casually strokes his chin and face. His voice is oozing confidence. I don't think I was even half this confidence while on stage in school for positive acts like singing or dancing. Here we're talking about murders, and this guy looks like he's touched water in Mars or something. So, he doesn't have to stay anywhere. I just, I get on the train, I get on the bus, and I'll be like, I know, I'm moving, I'm not. So, he thinks it's all an adventure. When you're enraged, you simply hop onto any public transport and look around for people to kill? Surprisingly, he never wanted to harm his own family. I try to get far away from my family when I feel myself slipping. Yeah. Yes. Have you heard? Have you ever hurt anyone in your family? I can't answer that because that would give you another state. You see what I'm saying? But yes. He used to immediately get far away from his family whenever he was angry or had violent thoughts. What about the victims' families? Certainly, he didn't care about anybody else. These weren't supposed to be people I killed. Mm -hmm. These were people that had nothing to do with people hiring them to do stuff. For, for the Motel 6, was, was that supposed to happen? Or? No, she struck me. Funnily enough, he admits that some of these people shouldn't have died, which means that it's okay if the others did. For example, Casper was his friend, and he implies that he shouldn't have killed her. For Africa, he says that she struck him, so he killed her as he doesn't like anybody striking or hitting him. So apparently, out of his victims, Van chose who he didn't really want to kill. Mind you, killed them anyway, and who he wanted to kill. I don't like being a hit. According to him, hitting or striking him was a valid enough reason for him to retaliate and kill. Well, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if he thinks he killed the innocent and beautiful Africa Hardy in self-defense or something. Throughout the available footage, he's not seen breaking down or sounding, looking, even sad one time. It's almost like he's the narrator and the antagonist of the story. It really looks like he's disconnected from all of the incidences and murders, and it is clear that he is absolutely unaffected and remorseless. It is most likely that he was a psychopath. It's important to note the seven characteristics of the modern psychopath, according to Psychology Today. The first is pathological lying and manipulation. Van manipulated his victims to make them believe him and trust him. That's how he got these women to meet him alone in secluded spots. Even though all of his victims were sex workers, he surely made them feel safe enough to trust him. Second is lack of morality and rule breaking. Psychopaths have little or no conscience, and we can clearly see Van's total lack of morality during the interrogations. Last year's really, I can't work. They want seven years, they want this. I want to get my ID, they want to get my ID. It's just so much. I'm just like, I'm tired. He had zero regard for any of his victims, and of course, he broke rules and laws by murdering innocent people. He had no regard for human life, let alone regard for any laws, rules, or morals. Next up is lack of empathy and cold-heartedness. As we noticed, he talks about his murders like they're some metal-worthy achievements. One by Dora Miller, one is by, I want to say, one, two, three is by Georgia. He has zero empathy toward his victims. He talks about how he killed them and where he dumped their bodies in a very matter-of-fact fashion. It seems like he's detached from all of his actions when he's talking. He's a cold-hearted killer who doesn't care about anyone. He doesn't regret any of his acts, shows no remorse whatsoever, and lacks any emotion. Then we have narcissism and false superiority complex. Van's entitlement and false superiority are clearly visible in the interrogation. He not only thinks that it was okay to kill people just because he was angry or they struck him, but also feels like he didn't really commit any crime. He belittles his heinous crimes by casually calling them mistakes. He also treated women like objects who were meant to obey him. He raped all of his victims and then murdered them. In some way, he felt like he was superior to women and had the right to do whatever he wanted with them. The next trait is gaslighting and psychological bullying. His ex-girlfriend, Saritha, had told the police that Van used to tie her up when he went to work so that she wouldn't run away. 
He was always suspicious and would create an unpleasant environment for her. He had also threatened to kill her once when she refused to have sex with him. He had told her that he can easily make her disappear. This was a sign of gaslighting and bullying, where he was unable to see that there was something majorly wrong with him. Instead, he thought that she was to blame. Next up is lack of contrition and self-servicing victimhood. When caught in the act with their unscrupulous behavior, most sociopaths and psychopaths will not show signs of contrition or remorse, unless it's strategically advantageous for them to do so. On the contrary, they are more likely to double or triple down on their aggressive tendencies, increase hostility, deny responsibility, accuse and blame others, and maintain a facade of arrogance and conceit. This description sounds like it was written for Darren Dion Van. You can see how he's confidently shifting the blame onto his victims by saying they triggered him. He makes it look like he reacted to someone already existing wrong actions by his victims. And the final trait is situational sociopath or psychopath. A situational sociopath or psychopath is someone who comes across as polite and respectful towards some people, but then shows inhumanity, harshness, and cruelty toward others. Targets of situational sociopathy or psychopathy are usually people or groups who others think are other, lesser, or weaker. Van's victims were all sex workers who can be considered as weaker groups because, unfortunately, society doesn't accept them very well, nor do they have proper support from any other organizations. There's not one point out of these seven that doesn't match Van. He can probably be considered a psychopath, a cold-hearted murderer who treated women as objects, and not as living beings who had friends and families just like him. His behavior during the interrogation is infuriating to say the least. Forget about shedding a tear, he shed not a speck of guilt or shame. After all of his ridiculous narration, trying to make the women look bad and himself look quite honest, it was time for the authorities to get to work and get to the bottom of everything. The uh, individual that committed these crimes, he, seeing his MO was to put uh, people in the abandoned, uh, these dead women in abandoned housing. All of the victim's bodies were found and it was time for Van's hearing and trial for his multi-murder rampage. Darren Dion Van made his initial court appearance on October 28, 2014 in Lake County Criminal Court. His behavior in court was a stark contrast to his behavior during his first hearing, the week before when he had refused to speak or even participate in the hearing. Darren Van uh, came in and was uh, said, will you tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth? And he didn't respond. And the magistrate asked him again, and he didn't respond. And she asked a third time, and he didn't respond. Then she warned him that if he does not respond and speak in this initial hearing, that he will remain in jail forever. On this day, however, he seemed to politely answer all questions by magistrate Kathleen Sullivan. Sullivan entered a preliminary not guilty plea on his behalf. She read the charges he would face and asked him if he understood all of the charges before the court hearing began. Van was charged with two counts of murder, two counts of murder in the perpetration of robbery, and two counts of robbery resulting in serious bodily injury. Lake County prosecuting attorney Bernard Carter, who represented the state during the hearing, said previously his office was in the initial stages of determining if the death penalty would be sought in Van's case. In another bizarre twist of Van's mind, he said during this hearing that he will not hire a private attorney and will retain court-appointed public defender Matthew Fetch. Sullivan granted a new protective order in the state's case against Van in the homicide of Anith Jones. This same order was granted the week before in the state's case against Van in Hardy's homicide. The order meant that officials involved in the investigations couldn't speak to the public or media about the case while it was pending. The state was also prohibited from speaking to Van unless he initiated the conversation. The case became very important to the entire nation. Everyone was seeking justice for all the innocent lives that were ripped apart too soon by a monster named Darren Dion Van. Many were hoping for the death penalty. It was some time before his trial that Van decided to hire an attorney instead of representing himself in court. 
However, there was a lot of back and forth that happened during the hearing and trial, mainly because of the involvement of possible death penalty. His trial was originally supposed to begin on June 22, 2015, but the date was cancelled on April 17, 2015, when the request for a death sentence was filed. The trial date of June 22, 2015 was then put in place. Van's attorneys requested that the trial be delayed, and the trial was again delayed in January 25, 2016. In December 2015, Lake Superior Court Judge Diane Ross Boswell recused herself from hearing the case. Judge Samuel Kappa subsequently said he would take the case. In December 2015, Van's trial was delayed yet again to July 25th, 2016. On March 7th, 2016, Van was charged with the murder in the deaths of five additional victims. The death penalty was originally sought for each. The following day, Van was also charged with rape and attempted murder for an alleged February 2014 attack. And if you thought after all of this, Van would have turned from monster to semi-human at least, with some remorse or regret, or some kind of positive change at least, wait for it. Van was additionally charged with battery by bodily waste for allegedly throwing a carton of urine and feces at a Lake County Correctional Officer at the jail on February 24th, 2016. As if his mind wasn't dirty enough, some people never change. They only get worse, and Van is a classic example of this. Van's attorneys tried hard to get rid of some of the charges. They also wanted to desperately get rid of the possibility of the death penalty that was looming over his head. First degree felony with the violence that was involved in the report that I saw, that seems a little out of the ordinary. In April 2016, Judge Samuel Kappas denied a motion by Van's attorneys to sever the murder cases of Anith Jones and Africa Hardy. And as a result, the capital murder trial in said cases would have continued as one. In a motion filed August 5, 2016, Van's attorneys argued that Indiana's death penalty law is unconstitutional. In January 2017, a Lake County judge decided that Van could make an appeal with his claim that Indiana's death penalty statute is unconstitutional. In April 2017, the Indiana Supreme Court turned down Van's request to look at the constitutionality of the state's death penalty statute before he went to trial. After a lot of delays, jury selection was finally scheduled to start on September 17, 2018, and the trial began October 22, 2018. With all the wrongs that Darren Dion Van had done, with all the horrific crimes he had committed, nothing short of a life sentence or death penalty would be acceptable. The authorities had already given disappointing punishments in the past for his sexual assault in 2009 and his violence toward his ex-girlfriend, Saritha, in 2004. Let's not forget that he was a low-risk sex offender who went on to murder at least seven women. So was the court going to provide justice to the families of the victim? The answer is yes. Even though he didn't get the death penalty, which the prosecutors and the families of many victims hoped for, one thing is for sure, he's never getting out of jail. On May 4th, 2018, Van pleaded guilty to seven murders. As part of the plea agreement, prosecutors dropped the death penalty. On May 25th, 2018, Van was sentenced to seven concurrent life sentences without parole. Darren Vaughn was sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences for murdering seven women. He will die in prison. According to Judge Samuel Kappas, the idea of a serial killer had struck fear in the heart of the community. He thanked the prosecutors and police for all their efforts in capturing Van and providing evidence against him. Hammond and Northwest Indiana are safer today because this murder case was solved by the Hammond Police Department. Darren Dion Van is currently serving his life sentence at Wabash Valley Correctional Facility. For such gruesome murders and such heinous crimes, it's best that the world outside his prison never sees him again. It's just sad that it took so many women's deaths to finally track him down and put him away for life. They were all someone's daughters, sisters, wives, mothers, lovers, and friends. They didn't deserve to have their lives taken away like this. It's a shame that he wasn't caught earlier. If only the authorities had been stricter with punishing him for his previous crimes, and if only the police had believed 
believe Thomas Hargrove's algorithm that warned them about a serial killer in Gary, they might have caught him earlier and saved many lives. So, are there more than seven victims? If we go by Darren Dion Van's confessions... Four or five in California. How many in North Carolina? One, because I ain't staying all. Texas, I think there's two. At least two in Milwaukee. Then there's three in Minnesota. I'll say about seven in Detroit. The answer is, unfortunately, yes. In August 2021, Ben Kiebrick, the host of The Algorithm Crime Podcast, obtained tape recordings via Freedom of Information Act requests. In these tapes, Van confessed to detectives that many of the unsolved murders across the country were committed by him. He claimed to have killed dozens of women, predominantly in Chicago, Illinois, but also in other locations, such as California, North Carolina, Texas, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Detroit, Michigan. There should be some kind of mass movement to investigate all of the missing people in these places and help Thomas Hargrove in his quest to find not just more of Van's victims, but also more serial killers. Van also said in the interview that he murdered four or five women in California and only one in North Carolina because he didn't stay there very long. He continued to shamelessly reveal to the police. In Texas, at least two. Two in Milwaukee, then there's three in Minnesota. I'ma say about seven in Detroit. When detectives asked- How many in Chicago? Chicago, it's a lot. I'm speechless by this inhumane creature's audacity, monstrosity, and complete lack of empathy. He was killing women like he was breathing. It was that easy for him. What a disgusting excuse of a person. A whole life sentence falls short now, for it feels like justice actually happened. This was a deeply saddening chapter in the victim's family's lives. She, she helped many, many people, you know, get closure, get get the freak off the street, you know. Those beautiful women will never return. They will never get another chance to live their lives or be with their loved ones. They will never have a chance to tell their story. But one thing is for sure, they'll forever be missed by their families and friends. I hope the victims' families find peace and strength to move on from this tragedy. These women were taken away by a man who felt absolutely nothing, probably not even for himself. What do you think about this case? What do you think about the killer, the trial, and the sentencing? Was justice served? Let us know in the comments section below. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Darren Dion Van. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.